Uh, and my final point uh, that last time, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was that uh, we see time and time again through Joseph's life that uh, he trusts God. But then there's that moment where he wobbles. Where he comes up with his own plan and uh, instead puts his trust in the cup bearer. Genesis 40, verse 14 to 15. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention to me Pharaoh, mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of Hebrews and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Then in verse 23, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. Well, that's where we're picking it up today. Genesis 40, that last verse, 23, and then 41 through to verse 14. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled. So he sent for all of the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with me, his servants, with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker and the house in, in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he had interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Let's pray. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would be speaking to each and every one of us this morning as we dig into this passage, as we look at this next step in Joseph's life. I pray, Lord, you would be speaking through me, Lord. Bless me, Lord, as I speak to my brothers and sisters this morning. Amen. Well, a lot of that passage was the, uh, the dreams that Pharaoh had, and um, that's kind of part two. We'll be looking at Joseph's being called in to interpret those dreams next week. This week we're looking at God's timing. See, Joseph trusted God when his brothers betrayed him and he trusted God when he was put into a position of authority in the house of Potiphar. He trusted him when he was tempted. He trusted him in prison and then he had that wobble. I told you last time it's so important that details like that are in the Bible. It's full of humanity. It's full of our mistakes, full of our failures and it's so relatable for us. Joseph tried to get out of this situation on his own and it doesn't work. The cupbearer forgets him. Obviously he was just so happy that he didn't get killed like the baker and forgot all about the dream he had and forgot all about Joseph. Yet we read this morning that God still used that failure, he still used that attempt to get himself out of prison. It was the cupbearer that tells Pharaoh of Joseph. It was just two years later. You see, it was in God's timing, not in Joseph's timing. God has a plan here. That's clear. He gave those two men dreams so that Joseph could interpret them in the prison. The cupbearer was restored. And as we read years later, Pharaoh has some crazy dreams and the cupbearer goes, ah, yes, um, Joseph, <laughs> let me tell you about him. 
God always knew that, that Joseph would do this, that Joseph would tell the cupbearer, you know, remember me. It was always God's plan for Joseph to be called to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. But God made him wait because God already had a plan and it all happened in God's timing, not in Joseph's timing. John Piper says of impatience that impatience is a form of unbelief. It's what we begin to feel when we start to doubt the wisdom of God's timing or the goodness of his guidance. It springs up in our hearts when the road to success gets muddy or strewn with boulders or blocked by some fallen tree. The battle with impatience can be a little skirmish over a long wait in a checkout line. Or it can be a major com combat over a handicap or a disease or circumstances that knock half your dreams. The opposite of impatience is not a glib, superficial denial of frustration. The opposite of impatience is, depend is a deepening, ripening, peaceful willingness, either to wait for God where you are in the place of obedience or to persevere at the pace he allows on the road of obedience. To wait in his place or to go at his pace. I struggle with impatience sometimes. I'm sure you do in day to day life. You're caught behind that person that's just driving so frustratingly slowly or trying to just quickly pick something up at the supermarket and it feels like there's just, oh, so many women with buggies in the way. <laughs> Get out of the way. Now having kids, that tests your patience. But let me tell you that after eight years of fatherhood, I have a lot more patience now than I did eight years ago. I can't remember who, but recently someone said to me, I don't want to ask God for patience because I know then he will send situations to test my patience to grow it. It's so true. Verse one, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Now, we don't know what happened in those two years. The Bible doesn't tell us. Next chapter, it's two years later. But the Bible does tell us about waiting. It does tell us about God's plan. After all, God's the one that gives Pharaoh those two dreams, isn't he? So God could have given Pharaoh those two dreams the day after the cupbearer had been returned to his rightful position. But God clearly wanted Joseph in prison for those two more years. And like I said, we don't know why, but, you know, perhaps there was just more work for Joseph to do in that prison. We, we know from what we read before those couple of weeks ago when we were looking at Joseph pursuing a life of holiness, the, how well Joseph was serving people in that prison. Maybe he still needs to learn more patience and more humility before being risen up to become the second most important person in Egypt. Whatever it was, God had a plan. And that's what the Bible does make clear, because otherwise it wouldn't be in there. It wouldn't say two years later. It wouldn't tell us that Joseph had to wait those two years. It's put in there because it's important. It's important we understand. Joseph tried to manufacture a way out of his situation. In a moment of frustration, he tried to find his own way and didn't trust in God. But it happened at God's timing because God's timing is perfect. But let's look at some passages together about trusting in God, about God's perfect timing. Hebrews 6 verse 12, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Isaiah 64 verse 8, yet you Lord are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are the full work of your hand. Proverbs 3 verses 56. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. How long did Abraham and Sarah have to wait before God fulfilled the promise to give them a son? They were in their old age. It was a long time, a long journey for them. Moses spent 40 years in exile before God used him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. 
King David, uh, he knew from a young age that he was going to be king. God told him. He had to wait a long time, though. He had to defeat Goliath, become a great warrior in the Israelite nation, become a advisor to King Saul, go on the run from King Saul, who then turned on him in jealousy. It was a long journey for David before he became king. Joseph's mum, Rachel, loved Jacob, but had to wait years to marry him. She was deceived by her own father, who married off her sister to Jacob first. But eventually, in God's timing, Jacob and Rachel married, and they had Joseph. Well, the whole story of Joseph, Joseph's life, everything we're learning right now wouldn't have happened if he hadn't been born when he was born, if Rachel hadn't had to have wait to marry Jacob. God's got a plan. God has always got a plan. He's all powerful. Surely he could have given Abraham and Sarah a son straight away. Or, you know, sent Moses back just a year after he'd been in Midian. Made David king straight away. I mean, he defeated Goliath. That was an incredible victory. All the big, powerful, strong men, they were quaking in fear at Goliath. And up steps the boy, David, with all his faith in God and one pebble, down Goliath goes. God's plan is better. His timing is better. Because there were lessons in all of those journeys for all of those great biblical men and women. And there's always lessons. There's always shaping in our journey that God's doing in our lives. Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yield seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. We can trust God because he knows best. His plans are best. Many of you know that I am a plumber and teaching engineer. And uh, so when I go to somebody's house, they are trusting me when they employ me to do the work in their house. They trust that I know how to fix that problem with their boiler. They trust I know how to install a bathroom for them correctly that's not going to leak a week later. And the reason they trust me in that is because I have trained in it. I have learned everything I need to learn and I've spent 15 years working in the industry. I had a, a, an operation a number of years ago on my arms and I went into that hospital and I trusted that the surgeon knew what he was doing. Let's say that this little stone, that represents all of my knowledge, everything I know. Well, compared to how much God knows, that's my knowledge. Well, God's knowledge is the whole earth. That's, that's the difference between our knowledge, the things that we know, the things that we learn, the things that we become accomplished in and what God knows. God knows everything. This stone compared to the whole world. I'm not going to go cut somebody's arms open. I don't have a clue how to do that. Some people do try to do their own plumbing, by the way. That doesn't usually go well. I actually get quite a lot of work fixing other people's problems. Okay, so Joseph had a wobble. But apart from that, he had trusted God and he continues to trust God after this. And remember last time we looked at his example of pursuing holiness no matter his circumstance. Well, it's the same with trusting God, no matter the circumstance. Remember I said about not asking God for patience because just knowing that he's going to send things out <laughs> our way to, to make that patience grow. You see, God is shaping us. God is working in us. God wants us to go on that journey. God's got a plan for us and God's got perfect timing for us. But there's so much happening in the in-between. 
uh, a couple of weeks ago um, I shared my testimony on the journey to uh, towards uh, leading the church at the moment and and hopefully towards eldership too that uh, soon uh, that's what I am pursuing um, and uh, I told you that that, that journey kind of started for me and Kezia when we first left London which was five years ago uh, and, and moved to to Weathering Set and now to Stone Market and how God had done a, a work in our life he'd, he'd, he'd really healed us of some some bad things that had happened and then in 2017 we were planning to leave King's Church and God said no I, I didn't know why then I didn't have a clue that I was heading towards leading this church I didn't know that in 2017 but God did and it was God's plan so God told me to stay in King's Church and and me and Kezia we obeyed and we stayed in King's Church and he could have the next day made me leader of King's Church if he wanted to he's God he can do whatever he likes but he didn't want to because he had a plan he had a journey for me to go on and as I explained in my testimony the journey that I've been on this past five years I have become so much closer to God I've got a much better relationship with God than I have before this last two years on the lead course I've learned so much just not just theologically but in my heart as well about the Lord I, I've learned how to preach and hopefully got better at it it's been a, a journey from five years ago to now but if it hadn't have happened then I wouldn't have been prepared for what God has given me to do now but you see, God requires our engagement. Trusting God doesn't mean just sitting back and doing nothing. Have you heard about the story, funny story, not a real story, of the man who gets uh, stranded on a desert island? And he goes, oh Lord, Lord, please, Lord, will you save me? I don't, I don't want to die here. I want to go home. I want to be with my family. And uh, he's praying and he's trusting that God will save him. And a little fishing boat goes by the island and they say, hey, come on, come on come on we'll take you back to the mainland he said no 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 thank you thank you i'm all right i i prayed and i'm trusting that god will save me and a few weeks later he's still praying in earnest and a cruise ship comes on by and they say come on come on they can't believe they found this castaway and he, no 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 thank you i am trusting god he's going to save me and then finally a helicopter lands on the island and he says no 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 thank you no i'm waiting i'm trusting in god to save me well, a few weeks later, the man dies and he goes to heaven and he goes to God. God, I prayed and prayed. Why didn't you save me? And God says, well, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What more did you want? <laughs> you see, God wants our engagement. Trusting him isn't a lazy thing. Trusting him, it's not flippant. It's not, oh, well, it's all right because I trust God. No, we've got a journey to tread with God. God's got things to teach us. God wants to grow us. God is the potter and we are the clay. He's moulding us. But that, that requires our engagement. Look at Joseph, betrayed by his brothers into slavery. He's trusting God and he's pursuing holiness. He works diligently in his slavery to the point where he is risen up to, to be the highest person in command in Potiphar's house. He gets all of that trust. He didn't do that by just sitting back and doing nothing. He worked in his circumstance, he pursued holiness and he trusted God. And even when it all goes wrong and he ends up in prison for something that he didn't do, he's still trusting God, he's still pursuing God. When those men come to him with their dreams, he interprets them. He doesn't, he doesn't just say, oh, whatever. He, he's not lost heart, he's still trusting in God. See, God's timing is perfect. He knows everything and we can trust him. But how do we do that? How do we trust him no matter our circumstances? Very easy to look at Joseph and say, well, apart from that little wobble, Joseph trusted God, so trust God. So let's look at some application now for things that we can do to help us to grow in trust for God. First up, the Bible. I said last time, and I've already said it this morning, that one of the things I love about the Bible is the humanity in it. And, and, and that's so deliberate. The Bible is so relatable for us because we can see ourselves in our biblical heroes. We can see ourselves in the men and the women throughout the Bible that God did great things through.
Because if the Bible was just full of perfect humans that never got anything wrong, that would just be so unattainable, so unrelatable for us. That would be so disheartening. I mean, how could we ever be like Joseph, like Abraham and Sarah, like Moses, like David, like Rachel? But we get to see their humanity too. We get to see their faults. We get to see those times when they wobbled and they didn't trust God. And we get to see that God blessed them anyway, that God had grace for them anyway, that God loves them anyway, and that God's timing was perfect, and that their stories worked out the way that they were supposed to, not the way that perhaps they maybe wanted to. I'm sure it was no barrel of laughs for Rachel watching her sister marry the man that she loved. I'm sure that extra two years in prison for Joseph wasn't always a great time. See, God's perfect timing it's all through the bible and of course the main narrative of the bible from creation to the fall to christ coming and our redemption in him is dying for us god's perfect plan god's perfect timing when jesus was tempted by the devil in the desert he gives us an example he shows us how to respond. Three times the devil comes at him and three times Jesus rebuffs him with scripture. Three times Jesus quotes scripture back at the enemy. We can do that too. We can anchor ourselves in the scriptures, anchor ourselves in God's word so that when impatience comes, when we're in the middle of that situation, when we're in our extra two years in prison, as it were, we can trust God and we can look at those times when God time and time again has come through for those people in the Bible. Time and time again, God's perfect plan. Secondly, prayer. Philippians 4 verses 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about everything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer isn't just for church, and we had a wonderful time of prayer just now as we were worshipping God and we just prayed for the nation of India. Prayer is not just for our prayer meetings we had our prayer meeting on wednesday and it was great to have those uh, it both online and, and linked together but in person as well the first time we've had in-person prayer meetings for well over a year and a half probably coming on two years now prayer is not just for those quiet times that we set aside to pray and that's very very important as well i'm not saying that these things aren't important these things are very important it's very important to pray corporately it's very important to pray at specific times to set aside time to spend with our lord but it's also important that prayer becomes something in our life that's just natural to us something that we just do years ago i heard something very useful about praying in your day-to-day -day life a friend told me that if he's in the midst of a stressful situation or, or a moment, a sad moment, a tough moment, um, and he's unable to step out aside from that and spend some time in prayer, or, or he doesn't want to wait until later when he's got the time to pray, well, he sends up what he calls a bullet prayer. It's just, even just in your mind, just crying out to God. You know, sometimes it is right that we step aside and or set aside time to pray to God but it's also got to be a reflex that in that moment we just say, oh God just call out to God wherever we are whatever we're doing God is always there you see we don't have to wait until we go to that place where we meet with God Jesus did away with all that we don't have to go to the tabernacle anymore when Jesus died on the cross and rose again he created for us a connection with God so we can have that instant access to our father so we don't have to just set certain times to do it, as important as that is. We can in our day-to-day -day life, in every moment, when you're stuck behind that person that's driving so frustratingly slowly, well, you can ask God, God, just help me here. Just, you know, 
give me patience or just bless them lord we, you know we can pray we can talk to god prayer shouldn't be a, a last resort for us in troubled times or uh, our genie in a bottle oh i really need that i'm gonna pray to god prayer should be our first response just in our day-to-day -day life billy graham once said true prayer is a way of life not just for use in cases of emergencies make it a habit and when the need arises you will be in practice so joseph had a wobble that's okay we all have wobbles we will all have wobbles god has plenty of grace for us he really does more than we deserve but god also has a plan for us and perfect timing like joseph you might need to stay in that situation that circumstance for years to come and that can be tough i know that matthew 5 jesus says blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy blessed are the pure in heart for they will see god blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of god blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all things of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven or in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you as christians we are not promised an easy life in fact it's the opposite and that's okay because our father loves us and our father has a plan for us and our father has perfect timing our father is shaping us our father is growing us his plan is perfect his timing is perfect we're called to pursue holiness because he's holy and we're called to trust him because he knows best and we can trust God the Bible shows us that it's full of men and women who trusted God and God never ever ever let them down even though the Bible's also full of times they let him down Joseph trusted God he worked diligently in prison he worked diligently before that for Potiphar he kept using his gift from God he didn't shy away when those men came he discerned their dreams he was trusting in God and yeah he had his moments of impatience trying to do it on his own so will we God still loves him still blesses him even in prison God still loves us still blesses us still has a plan God had a plan for Joseph to raise him out of slavery out of prison to become the second most important man in Egypt he was effectively the Egyptian Prime Minister underneath the King Pharaoh God was working on Joseph all that time teaching him and growing him and shaping him now we obviously are not all going to become the second most important person person in this country I don't know math doesn't really work like that does it you can't have lots of twos it doesn't work but God does have a plan for each and every one of our lives God has a journey for each and every one of us to go on God loves us and he blesses us and he teaches us and he grows us even in the hard times actually usually especially in the hard times let me give you one last encouragement as we finish this morning Psalm 23 my Lord is my shepherd I lack nothing he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters he refreshes my soul he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake even though I walk through the darkest valley I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows 
Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you, you know best, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you love us, Lord, that you're interested in us, that you, you know us, each and every one of us. You're not a far off, uncaring God. You are a deeply personal and loving God. And you have a plan for each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to grow in trust for you, Lord, over these coming weeks. I pray, Lord, that we will pursue your scriptures. We will read your scriptures more, study your scriptures more. I pray that we will become a church that prays not as a last resort, a church that prays not just on those special occasions, but a group of believers that prays in our day to day life. Just a habit, Lord as we trust in you, God. Will you help us on that journey to trust you, Lord? Amen.